This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. The Romance of Tristan and Isolde. By Joseph Bedier. Translated by H. Belloc. Part the First. The Quest of the Lady with the Hair of Gold. My lords, there were in the court of King Mark four barons, the basest of men, who hated Tristan with a hard hate, for his greatness and for the tender love the king bore him. And well I know their names, Andret, Grinelon, Gondoin, and Denoelan. They knew that the king had intent to grow old childless, and to leave his land to Tristan, and their envy swelled, and by lies they angered the chief men of Cornwall against Tristan. They said, There have been too many marvels in this man's life. It was marvel enough that he beat the Mohawk, but by what sorcery did he try the sea alone at the point of death, or which of us, my lords, could voyage without mast or sail? They say that warlocks can. It was sure a warlock feat, and that is a warlock harp of his pours poison daily into the king's heart. See how he has bent that heart by power and chain of sorcery. He will be king yet, my lords, and you will hold your lands of a wizard. They brought over the greater part of the barons, and these pressed King Mark to take to wife some king's daughter who should give him an heir, or else they threatened to return each man into his keep and wage him war. But the king turned against them, and saw in his heart that so long as his dear nephew lived, no king's daughter should come to his bed. Then in his turn did Tristan, in his shame to be thought to serve for hire, threaten that if the king did not yield to his barons, he would himself go over sea, serve some great king. At this, King Mark made a term with his barons, and gave them forty days to hear his decision. On the appointed day he waited alone in his chamber and sadly mused, where shall I find a king's daughter so fair and yet so distant that I may feign to wish her my wife? Just then by his window that looked upon the sea, two building swallows came in quarrelling together. Then, startled, they flew out, but had let fall from their beaks a woman's hair, long and fine, and shining like a beam of light. King Mark took it, and called his barons and Tristan and said, to please you, lords, I will take a wife, but you must seek her whom I have chosen. Fair lord, we wish it all, they said, and who may she be? Why, said he, she whose hair this is, nor will I take another. And whence, lord king, comes this hair of gold? Who brought it, and from what land? It comes, my lords, from the lady with the hair of gold. The swallows brought it me. They know from what country it came. Then the barons saw themselves mocked and cheated, and they turned with sneers to Tristan, for they thought him to have counselled the trick. But Tristan, when he had looked on the hair of gold, remembered Isolde the fair, and smiled and said this, King Mark, can you not see that the doubts of these lords shame me? You have designed in vain. I will go seek the lady with the hair of gold. The search is perilous. Nevertheless, my uncle, I would once more put my body and my life into peril for you, and that your barons may know I love you loyally. I take this oath, to die on the adventure or to bring back to this castle of Tintagel the queen with that fair hair. He fitted out a great ship and loaded it with corn and wine, with honey and all manner of good things. He manned it with Gorvenal and a hundred young knights of high birth, chosen among the bravest, and he clothed them in coats of homespun and in hair cloth, so that they seemed merchants only. But under the deck he hid rich cloth of gold and scarlet as for a great king's messengers. When the ship had taken the sea, the helmsman asked him, Lord, to what land shall I steer? Sir, said he, steer for Ireland, straight for Whitehaven Harbour. 
At first, Tristan made believe to the men of Whitehaven that his friends were merchants of England, come peacefully to barter. But as these strange merchants passed the day in the useless games of draughts and chess, and seemed to know dice better than the bargain price of corn, Tristan feared discovery and knew not how to pursue his quest. Now it chanced once upon the break of day that he heard a cry so terrible that one would have called it a demon's cry, nor had he ever heard a brute bellow in such wise, so awful and strange it seemed. He called a woman who passed by the harbour and said, Tell me, lady, whence comes that voice I have heard, and hide me nothing? My lord, said she, I will tell you truly, it is the roar of a dragon, the most terrible and dauntless upon earth. Daily it leaves its den and stands at one of the gates of the city. Nor can any come out or go in till a maiden has been given up to it, and when it has her in its claws it devours her. Lady, said Tristan, make no mock of me, but tell me straight, can a man born of woman kill this thing? Fair sir and gentle, she said, I cannot say, but this is sure. Twenty knights and tried have run the venture, because the king of Ireland has published it that he will give his daughter, Isolt the Fair, to whomsoever shall kill the beast, but it has devoured them all. Tristan left the woman, and returning to his ship armed himself in secret, and it was a fine sight to see so noble a charger and so good a knight come out from such a merchant hull. But the haven was empty of folk, for the dawn had barely broken, and none saw him as he rode to the gate, and hardly had he passed it, when he met suddenly five men at full gallop flying towards the town. Tristan seized one by his hair as he passed, and dragged him over his mount's crupper and held him fast. "'God save you, my lord,' said he, "'and whence does the dragon come?' and when the other had shown him by what road, he let him go. As the monster neared, he showed the head of a bear and red eyes like coals of fire and hairy tufted ears, lion's claws, a serpent's tail, and a griffin's body. Tristan charged his horse at him so strongly that, though the beast's mane stood with fright, yet he drove at the dragon. His lance struck its scales and shivered. Then Tristan drew his sword and struck at the dragon's head, but he did not so much as cut the hide. The beast felt the blow. With its claws he dragged at the shield and broke it from the arm. Then, his breast unshielded, Tristan used the sword again and struck so strongly that the air rang all round about. But in vain, for he could not wound, and meanwhile the dragon vomited from his nostrils two streams of loathsome flames and Tristan's helm blackened like a cinder, and his horse stumbled and fell down and died. But Tristan, standing on his feet, thrust his sword right into the beast's jaws, and split its heart in two. Then he cut out the tongue and put it into his hose, but as the poison came against his flesh, the hero fainted and fell in the high grass that bordered the marsh around. Now the man he had stopped in flight was the seneschal of Ireland, and he desired Isolt the fair, and though he was a coward, he had dared so far as to return with his companions secretly, and he found the dragon dead, so he cut off its head and bore it to the king and claimed the great reward. The king could credit his prowess but hardly, yet wished justice done and summoned his vassals to court, so that there, before the barony assembled, the seneschal could furnish proof of his victory won. When Isolt the fair heard that she was to be given to this coward, first she laughed long, and then she wailed. But on the morrow, doubting some trick, she took with her Perinus, her squire, and Brangian, her maid, and all three rode unbeknownst towards the dragon's lair. And Isolt saw such a trail on the road as made her wonder for the hoofs that made it had never been shod in her land. Then she came on the dragon, headless, and a dead horse beside him, nor was the horse harnessed in the fashion of Ireland. Some foreign man had slain the beast, but they knew not whether he still lived or no. They sought him long, Isolt and Perinus and Brangian together, till at last Brangian saw the helm glittering in the marshy grass, 
and Tristan still breathed. Perinus put him on his horse and bore him secretly to the women's rooms. There Isolt told her mother the tale and left the hero with her. And as the queen unharnessed him, the dragon's tongue fell from his boot of steel. Then the queen of Ireland revived him by the virtue of an herb and said, Stranger, I know you for the true slayer of the dragon, but our seneschal, a felon, cut off its head and claims my daughter he sought for his wage. Will you be ready two days hence to give him the lie in battle? Queen, said he, the time is short, but you, I think, can cure me in two days. Upon the dragon I conquered his sort, and on the seneschal perhaps I shall reconquer her. Then the king brewed him strong brews, and on the morrow Isolt the fair got him ready a bath, and anointed him with the balm her mother had conjured. And as he looked at her he thought, So I have found the queen of the hair of gold, and he smiled as he thought it. But Isolt, noting it, thought, Why does he smile, or what have I neglected of the things due to a guest? He smiles to think I have forgotten to burnish his armour. She went and drew the sword from its rich sheath, but when she saw the splinter gone and the gap in the edge, she thought of the Mohawk's head. She balanced a moment in doubt. Then she went to where she kept the steel she had found in the skull, and she put it to the sword, and it fitted so that the join was hardly seen. She ran to where Tristan lay wounded, and with the sword above him she cried, You are that Tristan of the Leoness, who killed the Morholt, my mother's brother, and now you shall die in your turn. Tristan strained toward the blow, but he was too weak. His wit, however, stood firm in spite of evil, and he said, So be it, let me die, but to save yourself long memories, listen a while. King's daughter, my life is not only in your power, but is yours by right. My life is yours because you have twice returned it to me. Once long ago, for I was the wounded harper whom you healed of the poison of the Moholt shaft. Nor repent the healing, were not these wounds had in fair fight. Did I kill the Moholt by treason? Had he not defied me, and was I not held to the defense of my body? And now this second time also you have saved me. It was for you I fought the beast. But let us leave these things. I would but show you how my life is your own. Then if you kill me of right for the glory of it, you may ponder for long years, praising yourself that you killed a wounded guest who had wagered his life in your gaining. Isolt replied, I hear strange words. Why should he that killed the Moholt seek me also his niece? Doubtless because the Moholt came for a tribute of maidens from Cornwall, so you came to boast returning that you had brought back the maiden who was nearest to him, to Cornwall, a slave. King's daughter, said Tristan, no. One day two swallows flew, and flew to Tintagel, and bore one hair out of all your hairs of gold, and I thought they brought me good will and peace, so I came to find you overseas. See here, amid the threads of gold upon my coat, your hair is sewn. The threads are tarnished, but your bright hair still shines. Isolt put down the sword, and taking up the coat of arms, she saw upon it the hair of gold, and was silent a long space, till she kissed him on the lips to prove peace, as she put rich garments over him. On the day of the baron's assembly, Tristan sent Perinus privily to his ship to summon his companions, that they should come to court, adorned as befitted the envoys of a great king. One by one the hundred knights passed into the hall, where all the barons of Ireland stood. They entered in silence, and sat all in rank together, on their scarlet and purple the gems gleamed. When the king had taken his throne, the seneschal arose to prove by witness and by arms that he had slain the dragon, and that so Isolt was won. Then Isolt bowed to her father and said, King, I have here a man who challenges your seneschal for lies and felony. Promise that you will pardon this man all his past deeds, who stands to prove that he and none other slew the dragon, and grant him forgiveness and your peace. The king said, I grant it. But Isolt said, Father, 
first give me the kiss of peace and forgiveness, as a sign that you will give him the same. Then she found Tristan and led him before the barony, and as he came the hundred knights rose all together, and crossed their arms upon their breasts and bowed, so the Irish knew that he was their lord. But among the Irish many knew him again and cried, Tristan of Lyonesse that slew the Morholt. They drew their swords and clamoured for death, but Isolt cried, King, kiss this man upon the lips as your oath was. And the king kissed him, and the clamour fell. Then Tristan showed the dragon's tongue, and offered the seneschal battle. But the seneschal looked at his face and dared not. Then Tristan said, My lords, you have said it, and it is truth. I killed the Morholt, but I crossed the sea to offer you a good blood fine, to ransom that deed and get me quit of it. I put my body in peril of death, and rid you of the beasts, and have so conquered Isolt the fair, and having conquered her, I will bear her away on my ship. But that these lands of Cornwall and Ireland may know no more hatred but love only, learn that King Mark, my lord, will marry her. Here stand a hundred knights of high name, all who will swear with me an oath upon the relics of the holy saints, that King Mark sends you by their embassy offer of peace and of brotherhood and good will, and that he would by your courtesy hold Isolt as his honoured wife, and that he would have all the men of Cornwall serve her as their queen. When the lords of Ireland heard this, they acclaimed it, and the king also was content. Then, since that treaty and alliance was to be made, the king her father took his sword by the hand and asked of Tristan that he should take an oath, to wit, that he would lead her loyally to his lord. And Tristan took that oath and swore it before the knights and the barony of Ireland assembled. Then the king put his sword's right hand into Tristan's right hand, and Tristan held it for a space in token of seizing for the king of Cornwall. So for the love of King Mark, did Tristan conquer the Queen of the Hair of Gold? End of the Quest of the Lady with the Hair of Gold